De acuerdo, pues tenemos ahora un espacio para poder compartir, recoger esas well, preguntas. Well, we have now time to be able to share questions and remarks that may have come up after listening to this morning's presentations. Our colleagues have been talking to us and sharing thoughts about gender, the exercises to Protestants and the experience of exercises done as a group. I'm sure that there will be some remark or question, please. Una pregunta, Elizabeth. I speak in a English. question for Elizabeth. Uh, thank you for your talk and especially for this example um, of um, your uh, it was your retreatant who had an incestuous father. No, no, no it was no, just no. an example. But I was impressed by this example because this retreatant considered the fatherhood of God as a stumbling block more than his or her motherhood. My question is the following. When Jesus and the Sophia, la Divina Sabiduria, um, are accesses to prayer, to the process of the exercises, how can she or he, and because men also have stumbling blocks, can pray with this stumbling block? Because the fatherhood of God is, I would say, uh, very uh, a core of the gospel. And when I think in feminist theologians as Dorothy Sölle, who has written quite a lot about the fatherhood of God, how can this be a journey towards the fatherhood passing by this stumbling block? of her personal and very um, wounding experience, this injury uh, she has uh, lived, experienced deeply. I think my answer will not be very satisfying, but I, I think that the director here will be very important to help the person stay with the pain, not so much pain that it paralyzes because then the motion stops, but enough discomfort to attract and move one step forward at a time. Mm -hmm. I couldn't say outside of an individual relationship with a retreatant, uh, exactly how that will work. I would need to be in that relationship. But my challenge as the director is to hold the space with enough safety that the person can stay there and let God do the work God wants to do. So I couldn't predict how it will work out ahead of time. And I can't, as the director, make anything happen. What I can do, though, is hold that space, listen deeply and attentively, and as any good director would, try to notice the place where the movement is and where it is going and say, stay there. That's the best I can do because yes. each experience will be its own and God will work uniquely with each person. As yes. I say, that may not be satisfying, but- Yes, perhaps we can share later on. But my point is that the father out of good is a part of this generative text we heard about mm -hmm. uh, in the morning. So the generativity of God is his fatherhood, his or her fatherhood or motherhood. Uh, our, our human words are, uh, are limited, mm -hmm. but it's important to transform stumbling blocks 
into approaches. So this was my question, but uh, I think it's it's also a difficult question. I recognize. Well, but I also will say that um, the, just the notion fatherhood of God mm -hmm. is a limited theological way, of course, to yeah. talk about uh, one aspect of the Trinity. And what happened in this person's prayer is another image for that person, which was is often given the pronoun that is feminine and then can move forward one step. Maybe sometime later, the, the notion of father itself could be reclaimed, but that is way down the road. Tenemos otra pregunta. Another My question. question. I was most glad with your contribution. I'm giving myself often spiritual exercises to Protestants in Holland, where most of people doing spiritual exercises nowadays are Protestants. And uh, personally, I think it's very important to invest time to give time in accompanying and, and uh, producing or developing also digital products uh, for uh, Protestant Christians, because I think that on the long uh, run, it uh, could foster the ecumenical uh, dynamism in, uh, in Holland and elsewhere. And I would like to have your opinion about that. So about the ecumenical consequences of the experience of spiritual exercises of Ignatian uh, spirituality in uh, for Protestants. Um, okay. Well, I think it depends a little bit on where you are. Yeah. Um, so I would say in the UK, um, if you call the Anglican Protestants, they probably wouldn't like that at all. But still. Um, um, <laughs> I would say when people go to Binos, which is the big Jesuit retreat center in, in, in Wales, in the UK, um, they have mostly Protestant coming, coming to, to make the exercises there or, you know, exercises in different, on different levels. Um, I think what's been happening is that, how can I say this in a good way? Um, because there's so many Protestants making the exercises, sometimes, hold on to your chair, um, that Catholics feel a bit threatened by that, yeah? Which means that what happens in big, in big country, I mean, where the Catholic Church is not very big, is that the Protestants, they get extremely excited about this, especially about imaginative prayer, etc., because they find it so helpful, uh, and they get hold of bits of, of the exercises and enjoy it and love it. Um, and sometimes the problem is that they might not take the whole package, they just take bits because they get excited about it. And that's not always very good for ecumenism um, because what happens is that, you know, um, the Catholics would like to give the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and the Protestants, they like this, yeah? So I would say that it's very obviously good for ecumenism because what's happening is that um, the Catholic faith, I suppose, the, the Catholic way of thinking is, is there in the Protestant church as well. And it's, it means that the divide between the two ways of thinking narrows and it's not as, 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 as divided basically, that's what I find is the great thing about it. Um, and also that you realize that the Catholics and the Protestants are very similar, yeah? We all believe in Jesus, yeah? And what's the big deal? So, you, you know, but then on the other hand, it also creates a divide because you realize when you get close to each other that it's not almost, it's not the same and the different ways of being. So I would say it's both and to you, yeah? It's really good for the ecumenism, but it's not so good for ecumenism at the same time, yeah? So it's, it's, it's both and. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that gives you, I don't know if that's the answer that you would like, but I think that is it actually. It's, it's really good and not so good, yeah? <laughs> 
Oh, very greatly defined. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for the presentations. I have one for each one of you, if I may. Uh, so um, I think the, the point, uh, Elizabeth, that, that was being touched on in the earlier question is really a very important one because directors are not free completely to adapt. Um, they have an ecclesial responsibility. And so I suppose the, one of the key questions that runs through the whole question of adaptation is to what is absolutely fundamental and non-negotiable. And that's even recognized in the exercises because in, in the annotation, even when somebody is um, deviating, let's say, from the Christian norm, the role of the director is to help them come back to it. So there is a recognition that there is a normative um, uh, a position on faith. So that's one, uh, one question there. Um, Susan, I, I, thank you for those different points that you were making, but I would have thought that um, the three great solas of the Reformation uh, by faith alone, by grace alone, and by scripture alone, are actually fundamental points of convergence in the Ignatian text. Um, and I just wondered if you had any reflections on that. And uh, Jose, thank you very much for your presentation. I think it's actually a very important presentation, particularly with synodality at the, at the moment. But one of the things that often occurs to me is the sources of desolation in a group are very often individuals who are in desolation and prevent the group moving uh, in, into what we might call consolation. So I'm just wondering when you have that fragmentation in a group, um, what, what would you do procedurally? Thank you. Uh, I want to ask if I understand the question you were asking me. Are you asking me to see if I can say what is absolutely essential in the exercises? Is that the question you asked me? Well, I'm saying what, well, to some extent, I'm saying what would you regard as normative in the exercises that you simply can't go on adapting ad infinitum? I would say um, the key grace of each week, how you get there could be um, varied, but the key grace of each week needs to come before you move to the dynamic of the next week. When is that moment and how do you recognize it is what I, I'm reluctant to try to generalize because I think God is too creative with us. But we, we know the grace of each week. Find that and hold the space until that comes. And if a person doesn't receive that grace, all right, just stay there uh, and believe that God will still do something important with that person. Um, coming back to the exercises another time is quite possible. Setting aside the exercises while some kind of healing is taking place is also quite acceptable. The exercises are a tool, I would say, given to Ignatius and given to the church for us to um, employ creatively and without judgment, but keep holding that space and waiting and pointing to where life is getting greater and trusting that God will take that person where she, he needs to go. That's what I'm willing to um, stake my, um, my life on. <laughs> Um, okay, I think the reason why Protestants are so attracted to the exercises is because it's it's that, yeah, because it says something about those major things that um, were part of, of the Reformation, yeah. I also wonder, um, it's very, 
it's about the same time, isn't it, that Luther and and um, the rest are um, pondering things and coming up with things. Um, and I'm just wondering if if um, if if the exercises and the Lutheran Reformation, uh, the, the Reformation, are kind of they are attacking the same problem, but in different, slightly different ways. And because of that, um, the underlying stuff in both go together, uh, which means that it speaks to Protestants basically. Um, but having said that, it's still the exercises are resting on Catholic theology. And the Protestant church is not always resting on Catholic theology, which means that that's when the problems occur, I would say, yeah. Uh, so it's kind of dressed up in different clothes, I would say, the Reformation and the, and the exercises. But um, there are lots of very essential, well, very profound and essential things there that are the same. And I think that maybe that is why the Protestants are so attracted to it. And it's really interesting because... Um, <laughs> This particular Jesuits and uh, the Protestants, uh, the exercises weren't allowed in Scandinavia until like about 100 years ago, no, less than 100 years ago. Um, and because of that, when it was let low, loose, if you like, they go, watch, we want that, yeah? But before they, they, they couldn't access it. So I think there is, there is something about it that is really attractive. I don't know if that gives you some, some ideas. Mm. Thank you, James, for this thing of joining synodality and this sermon in common capital. Now, I think also, and also you join it with desolation. And I think synodality is a way of solving some desolation in the church. So, so that's one thing. And if we try to walk together and we are in a communal discernment, the thing is, let's try to walk at the rhythm of the weakest one, of the slowest one, of those who need more help. And that's one of the the things to do in desolation is just to take care of those who are slower. No? So in a group, it's not, it's not a group of discernment, it's not a group of therapy, it's not a group of just to focus in solving the problems of the members. That's why spiritual conversation has its order and its way, but taking care of the rhythm of the slowest helps to move forward and walk together, I would say. We have a couple of questions from people at the back of the room and then there's one here at the front and um, yes, three. Okay, so this round of three questions. Just a little bit for Suzanne. Uh, up until 15 years ago, I was Protestant and in giving the exercises to Protestants, I think it's imperative on the Catholic to really take the time to study the varieties of Protestantism that you referred to. Because, and, and the preparation days become very important here because it's trying to find where on the spectrum the Protestant is in terms of how they interpret scripture. Because the more literal one takes scripture, the smaller God gets. And the, more, and the less literal the Protestant expression is, the more room there is for the church. And if one doesn't see that it, it, in, in, in the person, and then uh, one could be locked in, you could be locked in the preparation days and, and, and essentially get nowhere. To your point though, that it, there is this appeal to be liberated from Protestantism that the exercises sometimes be are able to give us but um i think it's just a real it's just very important is to, to see how the individual interprets scripture because scripture comes before the church in protestantism and the the church is is responsible for piecing together the, the scripture for us so there's an inverse relationship and as all of us have to root ourselves in judaism beforehand we there's this whole path that, to be attentive to. So just to be mindful of those points. Um, and what's the question? <laughs> just wonder, just, uh, if just that's an experience you've had. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, 
when I, I mean, now when I've been preparing this, I've been thinking about it a lot. But when you sit there with people, um, it kind of, it becomes so important just to help the person to encounter God. Um, that I just think about that. How can this person encounter God? Um, and how do we how do we do this basically? Um, and what are they coming with? Who are they? And it, it varies. I mean, you can have two Protestants and they're so different that you, you know, you think, are they really from the same church? Um, so I would say it's 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 yeah, it's that listening to. I think that you were talking about as well, you know, it's listening to where is the spirit in this person and it helps to know a little bit when, when things come up, but then not to get too stuck into, oh, he's a Protestant, he should think like this because he might not do. So there's the, the whole, you know, it, it's quite complex, I would say. Um, well, it's as complex as it is to give it to any, any Catholic or, you know, but um, yeah, but it's, I, I think the, the points that I've been made making they're just really important to keep in mind, just in case, I would say, rather than um, rather than say this is they are going to be like this because they might not be. I don't know. I, that was just a comment to what you were saying. Yeah. Tenemos aquí una pregunta. We have a question over here. Such wonderfully rich presentations. Fine. Yeah. Um, my question or reflection is for Suzanne. Um, in South Africa, we have more Protestants than Catholics making and giving the exercises. And I resonate with so much of what you've, you've been sharing. Um, the one question I had is that sometimes, although when uh, people get into the exercises, that imaginative contemplation really comes alive and takes takes flame. Uh, initially, my, my experience has been that for many Protestants, particularly from the reformed traditions, where there's a lot of emphasis on reason, there can be quite a lot of suspicion and anxiety about imagination and emotion. That resonates with any of your experience um, in terms of, of journeying with Protestants. Yes, um, it does. Yes. Um, but I would say, I think it's changed a little bit. That used to be um, in Scandinavia and in the UK, that used to be a problem um, some years ago. When I first started, I had it much more than I have it now. Because um, imaginative prayer and Lectio Divina has kind of infiltrated the churches now in such a big way um, that you don't actually experience that as much, I would say, in, in, in the Scandinavian uh, churches and you still get the odd one uh, that would come especially people from um, who are you know who are intellectual who, who've been studying the bible and they might find it really really hard to get from here to actually dare to to uh, approach the, the the text in a different way but it's it's it was much more before and it's it's lessening out because i think People are, and they're grabbing, imagine, imagine, I said that, they're grabbing imaginative prayer and Lexio Divina and, you know, those ways of engaging. And because that's spreading a, a, amongst the young people, they haven't got this scientific way of thinking as much as they used to. Um, so I, I don't know, it's probably different for different Protestants in different parts of the world, I think, but I, that's, my, that's my experience. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A question here? So I have a question for Elizabeth. And um, in um, Scandinavia, uh, with uh, attending retreats, uh, I would say 75% or almost 80% of retreatants are women. And in CLC groups and in other active parts of uh, parish life, the majority are uh, women. So I appreciate your, your research and trying to find uh, stumbling blocks and difficulties for women. But I wonder in your gender studies, whether you can say that men can learn from women and then become more attracted to the spiritual exercise. Was it, <laughs> was, what is it that women have that make them understand the exercises? And a slightly different aspect of the question is, are we presenting these spiritual exercises today 
and I say this in a controversial manner, in a too feminine way, so that men do not get it. <laughs> That's an interesting question. <laughs> To the first, to the first part of your question, what do women have? I think that women are more willing to admit vulnerability quicker. And that's why the safe space is so important for men as well as women. Because if I can't be vulnerable, and my culture has told me I can't be vulnerable, how can I be vulnerable before God? Um, so I think maybe that's one thing women do quicker than men. But to your point, every woman is also different. So again, how can I make a, a, a generalization that goes across the board. Um, to the question about are the exercises overly feminized? I don't know if I have an answer for that. I, I think we would have to collect some experiences around this room to come to an answer on that. Um, I am coming out of a situation rather like what you're describing. And um, and it has changed in 30 years. It was very difficult for the Presbyterians that I work with to trust imagination uh, off the bat. So I started with scripture because that's where they could feel comfortable. And then you have exactly the problem that you said and you run into the exegetical and it takes a trust, a vulnerability to allow the exegetical to sort of sit over there. It doesn't go away, it sits over there. And then you invite the person to go inside of the mystery rather than study it from outside. Um, but are they over, overly feminized? I don't know. Ask the men. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to comment on that? <laughs> um, well, I, I think, well, I don't know. I think, um, I don't think it's the exercises. I think it maybe is, if there are lots of women, they attract women, yeah? Uh, so if you have a group of women, it's more difficult to get the men to come because they feel they want to be with men, you know. So if you have more men, you get more men, yeah. Um, so th th there's those kind of things as well that is going on. But I, I also think that um, the whole idea of um, retreat and reflecting, I would say, re retreat and reflecting in my context is more associated with women. So I don't think it's the exercises in themselves, I think it's more, it's actually more the whole idea of taking time out and reflecting is more at the moment in the UK and Scandinavia, it's more associated with women than men because men are more active. So yeah, I don't know. I, I think there's got so yeah, I don't think it's the exercises themselves because when the men come, it works, yeah, and they, they love it. And we had, when I gave the exercises uh, just a few weeks ago, we had more then, more men than women that time. Um, so it, it just depends really, I think. But I think it's the traction, it's not, it's not the actual text, yeah. Anyway, that's my thought. <laughs> Una pregunta más. I want to, uh, I want to thank all the presenters for the presentations and uh, to Pablo for uh, your rhythm and uh, the, the, the clarity. Uh, you, you have taken care of people like me who, um, you know, who need that kind of um, uh, pace 
uh, to understand um, uh, Spanish. Anyway, uh, my, um, I don't have questions, but I just have some comments or some thinking um, in response to Elizabeth's uh, presentation. Um, I, uh, I like the, um, your PowerPoints or your point saying the practical attitudes and actions for directors and, uh, direct, and the directees, um, men and or women. Okay, so there's no sort of uh, 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 divide like men versus women. So I like that. Um, uh, then I appreciate the challenges that, um, that we face uh, by uh, retreatants like coming in and said, uh, I, I don't like uh, uh, God, uh, the fatherhood of God or motherhood of God. That would be, if I were in that situation, I would not know how to deal with. But luckily, um, when, well, um, uh, I use Chinese, okay? So in our language, whether it is Cantonese or uh, Mandarin, uh, there's no um, agenda you know, in pronouns. Mm -hmm. So that, um, that sort of a challenge, I don't think, in that culture we face from, you know, from the linguistic uh, point of view. Um, that makes, uh, I think that makes life easier. <laughs> <laughs> and also, um, but, well, uh, English we, certainly stumbles with the pronouns. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the real uh, encountering, um, with a, uh, a, a retreatant who um, who say something like, um, uh, "I am poor. I am I'm weak. I don't I don't have money. So um, why do you uh, give? Why do you expect me to um, to like to pray this?" Uh, access to power, access to money. Now, um, if if I had such a uh, retreatant, I would say I would I would um, go back to like for example uh, the temptation of Jesus. You know, Jesus at that time didn't literally have power or money, but uh, that's the temptation. And every one of us, whether you are men or women, rich or poor, young or old. This is the um, possibility. You know, it, this, it, this is the real danger, the real temptation. So I would point him or her to, um, to, you know, to back to the scripture, to the gospel. You know, how Jesus um, deal with the, this temptation, which you know, every one of us be facing. Because this is the access, the potential to, to, <laughs> to, uh, to, to be tempted to, to actually fall into power and money. It's just, just this. So this is something for us to pray rather than literally, I don't have, I'm poor, so I don't need this sort of prayer. Okay. Um, that, that is how I would you know, deal with it. And uh, yes. Um, uh, since we can not adapt, but we can choose uh, the scripture, uh, the, the, the scriptures from the gospel to pray with. We don't need to stick to, wow, one, two, three, four, five. You know. So um, with, a, with a, a woman a retreatant, I would, I would use, say, for example, the gospel uh, uh, of Luke. You know. And that may, I, I think that will uh, put me, uh, you know, in a more sympathetic, um, compassionate 
uh, position with the retreatant, I think. Um, Yes, and I, um, agradecemos, agradecemos tu, tu comentario. We are very thankful for your remark. We will have time to, to comment as the days go on. I mean, I, I remind you about the fact that this afternoon we will have a group um, um, work session in which we will be able to share and we will have an assembly session. So there, that will be a good time as well to continue to reflect because indeed these are really complex and deep um, subjects. Participation has been excellent. So thank you. Thank you very much to the people who have participated, to our speakers and to the audience. And thank you to our keynote speaker indeed. But uh, of course, time is going on, time is running. Thank you as well to the people following this online, really. Right now, what we're going to do is give the floor to Pao because he's going to give us some logistic remarks for this afternoon's session.